Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, today my lips will praise you. God, we are here to praise you. This is your sanctuary. This is, we are your people. And God, on this day, we want to give you the glory that's due your name. But we know that for the rest of the week, we may struggle uh, with uh, trials at work or different circumstances that we have with friends. And God, we pray that you would speak a word to us, the word that changes our lives, that gives us strength, that gives us, that gives us life. God, that you would uh, do that work now, that within our hearts, not only would we desire to praise you right now, but every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day this week, that in our hearts, we would worship you, for you alone are God, you alone are our Savior, and God, we love you. We pray this in your son's name, amen. I want to show you a picture Uh, that I saw on the internet. You may have seen it. It's one of those images where when you see it, you see two different images. Uh, Looking at it, I saw it on the internet. And uh, some of you, you may see maybe a a younger woman, maybe 25-ish. From looking at her, you may think that she's she's very pretty, lovely, uh, fashionable. If you are a single man and if she is... Now, obviously, a believer, you'd maybe think about uh, taking her out to eat. Or she can be an older woman, maybe in her 60s, 70s, maybe pushing 80. She looks a little sad, has a very big nose, maybe not very attractive. You may not want to take her out to eat. You may want to help her walk across the street. Do you see those two images? So if it, one of them is, should I model it for you? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> she's looking away, and towards your left, you see a little uh, nose come out, a little petite nose. That's the 25-year-old. But there's this other image where if you're looking at the younger lady, you see that chin. Uh, that chin is that old woman's nose. Do you see that? And she's looking down. This is another picture. It's a picture that uh, someone from the Harvard, uh, Harvard Business School uh, showed their student before showing them the picture that we just saw. Uh, to half the class showed the picture on the left. To the other uh, class, uh, to the other part of the class, they showed the picture on the right. He, the professor had the class uh, look at the picture for about 10 seconds. So basically, uh, half the group is looking at one picture for 10 seconds, and the other group is looking at the other picture for about 10 seconds. And he has them all turn, and, turn it back in. And then he asks, uh, he asks the class, oh, who did you see? And so one uh, group, uh, one person from, the, from one side of the class said, oh, I saw a very pretty woman. She's probably maybe in her 20s or maybe 22. And immediately from the other side of the room, he, some person says, what? You joking? She's pushing 70 or 80. What are you talking about, a young woman? And then another person from the other side of the room says, what, are you blind? She's a young, good-looking lady. I'd like to take her out. She's very lovely. And the other room, other side of the room says, lovely, she's an old hag. And then it goes back and forth. And as they go back and forth, debating on who they see in, that, in, in the woman, uh, the person, one of the uh, class, uh, classmates goes up uh, to the original picture. And as they look at the original, can we go to the first picture? He points out the, points out the nose, the chin, the hair, the little feather thingamajig, and says, this is... The woman that I see, she's, very, she's about 22. And then the class is like, oh. And then the other person, uh, uh, a person from the other side of the class goes up and it shows them the nose, the eyes, the, uh, the, the, the mouth. And then the other side of the room says, oh, there's the old lady. 
Initially, as they were bantering, uh, they would describe the picture. And then they would say, well, uh, can't you see from the, uh, you know, that, that line in, in the bottom middle portion of the picture, that's the necklace of the young lady. And the other person's like, no, that's the, that's the mouth of the old woman. And they were going back and forth. And the lesson that the Harvard business professor wanted their class to learn is that when you have been preconditioned to see something in a certain way, it's very hard to see it. in any other way. That's very much like us and our Christian lives. We have been preconditioned in our hearts to see the world in a certain way. And because of the sin in our hearts, the lack of faith, the lack of trust, when we go through difficult circumstances, immediately we interpret it in a certain way. Where is God? He's not here God doesn't love me, or whatever we may be thinking. And in this text that we're going to be looking into today, it's going to teach us how important it is that we are very purposeful to see the trials and the events in our lives and the way in which God wants us to see them. If you could open up your Bibles to Exodus 16, that's a passage that we'll be uh, going through today. And in this passage, Exodus 16, it's it's just a couple of chapters after the actual Exodus. The first uh, 13 chapters or so, it's mainly about what what, uh, Moses is doing, what God is trying to do through Moses and taking the Israelites out out, uh, of Egypt. And then finally in in, uh, Exodus 14, they cross the Red Sea. And then Exodus 15, they sing a song of worship. And the majority of Exodus 15, a chapter right before, it's really about uh, who God is and and who they're learning about. Near the end of that is the first image of the Israelites. Uh, They are thirsty. uh, They come across some water. The water is bitter. And they complain. And God makes the water sweet. And then they rejoice. Well, just right after that, this is uh, Exodus 15. 16. But before uh, starting from verse 1, I want to uh, jump to verse 4. It's going to set the premise for this text. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, and listen to these words, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. The Israelites, they don't know that. They don't know they're being tested. But God is being very clear. Hey, I'm going to test, test the Israelites. I know we have a very negative notion of what testing is. But we have to understand biblically why God tests us. And we're going to see it's because it's actually God loves us. It's because God loves his people. He wants to refine his people. He'll test his people. Exodus 20, 20 says this. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you. Again, to the Israelites. Why? That the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. He tests the Israelites so that they would learn to fear him. They learn to understand who he is and therefore fear him, that he's the holy, almighty God. And so in that, so that they may not sin. It's really for them. God knows what's in the hearts of the Israelites. The Israelites don't know what's in their own hearts. And that's the the context in which we want to read this text. As we go through trials in our lives, that God is actually testing us, that these uh, these trials are tests that God puts in front of us. And the question is why? Why would God do that? Well, first we're going to see it's every trial is an opportunity to trust him. Can we repeat that? Every trial... is an opportunity to trust him. Let's read Exodus uh, 16.1. Then they they set out from Elam and all the congregation, the people of Israel, came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, and the the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of of Egypt. So this is about 45 days after they have departed. It's about a month and a half. 
So remember, the, the, the Israelites, they're coming out of Egypt. Egypt was uh, a country, a, a place where they, uh, they didn't really believe in the one and true God. They believed in many gods. And as they believed in many gods, they didn't know who Yahweh was. So now the Israelites, they're learning about who Yahweh is. They're learning about who God is. So it's been about 45 days since then. Verse 2, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness. And listen to these words. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Do you see the accusation that the Israelites are making? Saying, hey, Moses, Aaron, God, he took us out of Egypt to starve us to death, is what they're saying. Very uh, dramatic, right? You put some music uh, to you know, those verses, it's a Korean drama, right? They're, they're self-pitying, they're, they're loathing, they're like, thinking, what's going on? It's very, very, very dramatic. But let's give them a fair shot. And let's really think about Were they really about to starve to death? Well, how do we know? From other passages, we know, uh, for example, Psalm 78, 17, and 18. It describes the Israelites in the the wilderness. And this is how it describes them. Yet Yet they sinned still more against him. So they're sinning. Rebelling against the Most High in, in the desert. So not only are they sinning, they're rebelling Verse 18, they tested God in their hearts. So God tests at them. And in return, what's their response? Forget them, I test him. God, are you good? By demanding the food they craved. They tested God by saying, God, are you good? If you're good, you're going to give me this or that. And so it wasn't because of hunger that we see in Psalm 78. It wasn't because they were starving to death. It was because their hearts were sinful. They were desiring their own way. And it's in that we see a very important lesson. What always comes before complaining is a complaining spirit. The reason we complain is actually not because of the circumstances around us. The reason we complain is because we have complaining hearts. The Israelites had everything they needed, but they started complaining, grumbling before God, saying, you're not giving us what we need. But let me uh, clarify the idea of complaining. This wasn't uh, how the psalmists complain. You may, not call, you may not call it complaining, but if you read through the psalmists, the psalms, the psalmists, uh, they often have very uh, strong language. God, where are you? God, you know, and, and as, as, they, as the psalmist uh, write, uh, you would think that the, they have bad attitudes. But really, God welcomes that. God loves it when his people are honest before him, asking him, trying to learn from him. God, what are you doing? God welcomes that. That's not complaining. The kind of complaining here was described in, in that other psalm. They had rebellious hearts. They were testing God. They were really asking, God, are you good? It was the posture of rebellion, posture of pride. And so as I talk about complaining in this, uh, understand that I'm talking about complaining in that mindset, in that posture. And this, this greed that they had exaggerated their wants to become needs. And because of that, their perception is off. They actually remember the days of being in Egypt as good days. Their perception is way off. As they were in slavery, as they were pushed to the limits, as they were beaten when they made mistakes, they're remembering those days as the good old days. Do you see? It's a heart problem. Complaining is a heart problem. It's a perception that's off because our hearts are off. And that's why it's not just one or two people complaining. It's a whole community. They bring each other down. Why is complaining so bad? Why is complaining so bad? 
Well, some researchers have done uh, some studies on why it is bad. Nobody likes a complainer, right? If you, uh, if you are around a complainer or if you are married to a complainer, you understand it's hard to be around people who complain all the time, hard to be around people who whine all the time. And in this, uh, the scientists, uh, they made this observation. They said, they said uh, actually, listening to too much complaining is bad for you. This is their conclusion. Listening to too much complaining is bad for you. But even worse, and get this, being exposed to too much complaining can actually make you dumb. That's what they said. Doctors said this. Scientists said this. Listening to too much complaining can make you dumb. And the the article continues. The brain works more more like a muscle than we thought. So if you're pinned in a corner for, uh, for too long listening to someone being negative, you're more likely to behave that way. So missions teams, remember, if you're complaining, you know, you're, you're hurting other people. But in that, this is an interesting thing. Research showed that when you're exposed to 30 minutes uh, or more of complaining, it actually peels away uh, the neurons in your brain's hippocampus. The hippocampus is a part of your brain uh, that helps you problem solve. So that part of your brain that helps you problem solve, the more and more you hear complaining, it's taking away those neurons, and therefore your brain becomes more dumb. It becomes more mush. Well, that's one reason why you shouldn't complain. But we didn't come to church to learn about that reason. This is why, biblically speaking, why it's bad. Verse 7. For what are we? that you grumble against us. And this is Moses and Aaron. And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Twice in verse 8, Moses makes it very clear that the people's grumbling is not against Moses and Aaron. The people are complaining to Moses and Aaron, but what Moses and Aaron are saying, the grumbling is not against me. It's not against us. It's against the Lord. He says it twice. And then in verses 8, 9, and 12, eight, uh, Moses says that God hears it. Not only do we complain, but that God hears our complaining. The reason complaining is so bad it's because it's a complaint against god his character and who he is every cook understands this you go to a restaurant you complain about the food they take it personally every designer understands this you complain about their designs and they take it personally. It's a complaint given to the designer. You may be complaining about a situation. You may be complaining about the food or about the clothes or about some sort of artwork. But the designer or the, or the cook, they understand. It's a complaint against me. I need to change my cooking. And in the same way, God understands it like that too. When you make a complaint about your life, it's really a complaint to God. Is God good? Can I trust him? Is he worthy? See, complaining, complaining is a comment not on the situation, but complaining is a comment on the person and the character of God. So in any given situation, you can either let the circumstances define who God is. If your circumstance is bad and you have no faith, therefore you'll determine that God is bad. But the challenge that I have before you is can you let God define your circumstances? That even though your circumstances don't look so good, that you can still say with faith, God is still good. When you think about your life, you may be actually going through something. I do not want to belittle anything that anyone may be going through. It may truly be injustice. You may get uh, fired from work where it's not, where it wasn't your fault. Injustice, right? You may have ca- come from a family where it wasn't a healthy family and therefore you have needs, you have desires. That's true. But the issue is not about how valid your situation is. 
The issue is your heart. Can you still see God in the midst of difficult times? The lesson that he wants us to learn is that as we go through these trials, as we fail or as we succeed, what he wants us to learn ultimately, and I mentioned this before, he tests us so that we would know what's in our hearts. God already knows what's in your heart. That's how he sent Jesus. He knows that you need a savior. He actually has very little Uh, to expect from you. He knows that you have sinned, you're still sinning, you're still struggling. God knows that. So he'll test you. Why? Not so that you could prove yourself. You have nothing to prove before him. The reason is because he wants you to understand what's in your heart. So think about your situation. How do you respond? And it's in that you can see, I've got some work to do. I've got some issues within my heart. Back in the day when gold was used as currency, they would test whether the gold was real or not by pouring uh, nitric acid onto the gold. And as they poured on the, the nitric acid onto the gold, they would be able to see if it's real or not. If it was not real, it would dissolve. If it was real, it was able to uh, withstand the nitric acid and it would be, it would, it would be, it would be preserved. That's exactly what God is doing. It's in your trials. God wants you to understand what's in your heart so that you can grow, so that you can repent, so that you can learn. That's how God sees our hearts. That's why he tests us. But this is a beautiful thing. You see, God, as he sees our rebellion, as he sees our sin, you would think, he would respond in such a way where it may be discipline or whatever it is. But in this passage, we're going to see the way in which he responds to our rebellion. We're going to see that every trial is an opportunity to see his grace. Can we repeat that? Every trial is an opportunity to see his grace. As we see opportunities to trust him, what we also have to see is with our eyes of faith to be able to see how he provides for us day in and day out. In verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. Let's repeat that. Behold, I am about to rain, rain, I'm, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. Right after the grumbling, how does God respond? He wants to rain down bread for their cravings, not even their needs. That is the God that we worship. He is a gracious God. He loves us. He understands that we are messed up sinners. And so in that he meets us where, we're, or where we are at so often. Does God like the grumbling? Do parents like the grumbling? I'm thinking of a little one. I won't name who. But this little one that I'm thinking of when she is hungry, sometimes she'll ask for food. But other times, out of nowhere, she'll just, Hungry! I'm like, what's going on, right? Hungry! I'm like, Kara, are you hungry? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Like, okay, can you ask next time? (laughs) Oh, okay. Right? In the heart of a beautiful five-year-old is sin. Right? (laughs) Reveals to me. That's what I do. Before asking, so often I grumble. So often I go before God. God, I want this. I want that. I have my list of demands. I ask myself, did I even ask God? You see, It's in their grumbling, God pours upon grace. He pours upon the bread. And so in verse uh, 13, we're going to see how we learn to see grace. We learn to see grace when we realize we don't deserve grace. See, grace is actually all around us. Blessings are all around us. Provision is all around us. But when we start to realize we don't deserve it is when we start to see grace everywhere. Verse 13, in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in in the morning, dew lay around the camp. When the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. 
when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? What is this? What is this? What is this flake-like thing in front of me? Right? They don't know what it is. They've never seen it. It's a miracle. God is providing. For they did not know what it, they did, for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is bread that the Lord has given you to eat. What is it? It's bread given from heaven. What is it? It's grace for you, for your sustenance, for your life. Kent Hughes says, manna is the original wonder bread. I love that. Manna is the original wonder bread. God is the original early morning baker. He is the one who rises up early to feed the Israelites. He is the one, as you are sleeping, he waits for you. When you wake up, he gives you life. Every morning, he lets the sun rise. Every morning, he pours upon grace, upon grace in your life. How do you see it when you realize you don't deserve it? That as Pastor Eddie has said, that every day is grace. Every moment we have breath is grace. It's gift. And for us to understand every moment that we have, every year that we're married to our spouse, it's grace. Praise the Lord. that that person's still married to you. That is grace. You are not that pleasant to live with. (laughs) It's grace upon grace upon grace. You see, these physical reminders, these physical uh, gifts that we have, it's simply a reminder that we do have needs, we do have desires, and that we can't get it on our own, but it is God who is good, who knows your needs and your desires, and will give them to you. He will always give you your needs. Sometimes he'll give you your desires, depending on if it, if it will be good for you or not. See, he pours upon grace. Let's continue to read on. Verse 16. This is what the Lord commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. It's a buffet. Good news, amen? It's a buffet. Gather it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. Each shall take, each shall take, you shall each take an omer. That's about two quarts, according to the number of the person that each of you has in his tenth. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some, They they gathered some more, some less. Now listen to the words again. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had nothing, had no lack. Each of them, again, each of them gathered as much as he can eat. And then in verse 21, morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. That's grace. Not just, hey, you're in the wilderness. I'm just going to give you a little bit. But as much as you can eat, you will be satisfied. That each one of them had as much as they can eat. Each and every single Israelite was fed. And this happened for 40 years in the desert. God is faithful. Do you think they woke up each day worshiping God? Doesn't look like it when when you read the Exodus. They didn't see the grace. They took advantage of it. They felt deserving of it. And so in Deuteronomy 8.3, it says, And he humbled you to let you hunger, so he's letting them hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Why? That he might make you know that man does not live on bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This was a living experiment. It was a life lesson that he wanted to learn. As the Israelites went out each day looking for what they should have done, is to be reminded when they take it, God is feeding me. And that every morning, it was a a visible reminder, I'm still with you. You'll make it to the promised land. I am faithful. And that's the lesson, that we need grace. He teaches us. He lets us hunger. He lets us uh, be in these places so that we would understand we need him. That man does not live by bread alone, by, by, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's when you are able to start to see grace every single day. It's in that moment 
what starts to happen is you start to see the face of God every day. When you're able to see the grace and you're able to acknowledge it as grace, what happens? You acknowledge the giver who is gracious and therefore you're able to worship. When you see the grace, you see your God. When I first came to Korea, uh, something uh, was unexpected. There was a lot of dust in Korea, amen? <laughs> There's a lot of dust in Korea, whether it's yellow dust, micro dust, macro dust, whatever it is, a lot of dust in Korea. And because of that, uh, people wear these, uh, these filters on our, around their face, right? These masks to filter the, 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 the dust. But when I first got to Korea, I didn't know. You know, in the U.S., people don't do that, right? Uh, all I saw uh, when, um, before when I came to Korea uh, on the news, the only time I ever saw people wearing those masks was during the SARS epidemic, right? Because of the SARS epidemic, everyone in the airports had these things on. So when I came to Korea and people had these things, I'm like, oh no, like there's another SARS epidemic or something's going on, right? When we're, uh, when we're at a subway or, at, you know, and it's very crowded and people are around me and they have that thing, I'm like, you know, trying to dodge any kind of disease they have. Why? Because of the dust. I didn't know that, now I know. So what's up? if you have it, I'll assume that you're not contagious or you're not trying to kill people with some deadly disease, but that, you know, we're trying to protect ourselves from the micro and yellow dust. Well, it's pretty bad in Korea, but in Africa, it's actually much worse. And you, would, and you know why, because there's a lot more desert there. Well, elephants... Uh, what, they, uh, what they do is they often, uh, when they follow their, their parent, uh, the, the parent elephant, as the parent elephant uh, tracks along, uh, usually the, the baby elephant tracks along, and this has, that's how they migrate together. But during these dust storms, it becomes so bad that these elephants, they can't see that far ahead of them. They're actually blinded by the, by the storm, by the dust. And so because of that, uh, they could only see the few feet a- ahead of them and the different footprints of the elephant, the, of the elephant parent. And that's how they would follow the parent, by trying to look for the footprints. Where is he? Where is my dad? Where is my mom? And as they looked for the f- footprints, they would find God. Same thing with us. God is invisible. I have yet to see him. You may have, good for you. I have not seen him. However, I have seen his grace. As I see his grace, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of him as he is a giver, he is a provider. If you're wondering, where is God? My question to you is, where are your blessings? Where is the grace? Do you have salvation? Do you understand the cross? If you understand the cross, that's evidence that the Holy Spirit's working in you. That's grace. You may be thinking, well, isn't that just common? No, that's grace, that you are a dead man. come to life because of grace. And so in verse 35, the people of Israel ate manna for 40 years till they came to to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. 40 years, God is faithful. 40 years, every single day, feed some, feed some, feed them. Every single morning, feed some, feed some, feed some. It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And then more grace upon more grace upon more grace. And what he desired is that when you saw the grace, that you would acknowledge it as grace and thank him. The challenge to you is that you would see every moment of every single day of, with all the blessings and you would see it as grace. grace. Amen? You know, you say amen. I really wonder if you'll be good about it. Right? I mean, you heard what I just said. I just challenged you, okay? I just challenged you. Every single day, every single moment, any kind of uh, blessings that you receive, any kind of gift, you acknowledge it as grace. I guarantee you that basically all of us will fail by tomorrow morning. Right? You go to the bus stop, you're about to get on the bus, some other older lady comes and cuts you off. You're not thinking grace, you're thinking, who the heck is that lady, right? So easily, our hearts change, which is why the next lesson will be so important. Every trial is an opportunity to know him more. 
Can we repeat that? Every trial is an opportunity to know him more. Look at verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. Verse 10. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Same principle. As he provides the manna on the ground, and as they looked each day for it, What God was doing is, he says, when you go in the morning and you see the manna, you will also see my glory. Make the connection. When I give you a gift, remember, it's me that's giving it to you. It's my glory. I am right there. But they miss it. Day in and day out. They miss it. They miss it. They miss it. But you know, As I mentioned before, these tests, it's not just about passing or failing. God wants us to understand our hearts. Why? So that we would realize we need him. That's the point of the test, that uh, that when we fail, as we fail, that we would realize we need him. We can't obey. We struggle. It's difficult. The law is hard. God, we need you. And that's the lesson that God's trying to teach them. It's about relationship. As they succeed, as they obey, they realize there's blessing and obedience. But as they fail, they realize God's still there the next day. Man is there the next day. He's there the next day. It's about relationship. He puts you in trial to develop the relationship. He wants you. And so when you read uh, different passages that talks about this time in the wilderness, it always talks about it in, in, in terms of relationship. Deuteronomy 131. You have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. It's the language of a father taking his son to safety. I will carry you. I will do it. I will bring you to the promised land. Hosea 2.14, therefore I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness so that I could speak tenderly to her. It's a, it's a picture of a marriage. It's a picture of two lovers, a husband telling his wife, let me speak tenderly to you. I love you. Nehemiah 9.21, for 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. I mean, I wonder, did they see that? That for 40 years, it's not normal that the clothes that you wear for 40 years are intact. If you don't trust me, test it out. Chances are, for 40 years, they'll see some holes after the first year. They'll start to smell a little bit, whatever it is. It's not going to stay on you for 40 years. And with that, they're in the desert. Their feet didn't swell. Do you think they acknowledged that? I don't think they understood all the the physical aspects of how God was protecting them. That's grace. God pours upon grace even though we can't see it. Why does he do all of this? It's for relationship. He wants you. You know, as I was preparing for uh, this uh, sermon, you know, uh, OEM's not the easiest crowd to preach at, I think, because uh, there's people from all over the world, right? So I know that at different times I'm missing different people. And with that, there's different age graphs and all these. So it's a, it's a pretty big thing. And I was preparing all week for it, putting, you know, hours into it each day. So Friday night, I take my iPad and I was about to, uh, you know, just read a little bit of uh, the sermon again and, and pray through it to prepare for today. So I open up the Pages document and I click on it. And blink, says, your document can't be opened. I'm like, uh uh-uh. uh, <laughs> nah, uh uh. Press OK. I press, you know, the document can't be opened. So I get up from the bed. I'm like, I don't know what was, but I started like, cracking my neck. 
I'm like, what's going on? Like, what am I doing? I'm like getting about to get into a fight, you know? Like, the, you know, iPad, you're going to work. You see, I put a lot of work into you, and I want my church people to be blessed. You're going to work, right? Click on it again. I'm like, no, it's not. I <laughs> blink. It's okay. I'll just go to my computer. It's going to be safe there, right? So I calmly, you know, I trust the Lord, calmly walk over to the office, go on my computer, double click, blink. Document can't be opened. It's a great look. No, no, no. You know what the funny thing is? The whole time, I'm very well aware of the sermon topic, right? It's about trials. What do you do when God tests you? My God, you're funny. You know what you're doing. I click on it again. I look at the actual document, and then I look to the, to the right of it where it tells you the memory, you know, how big the size, how big the, the file is. It says zero KB. There's like nothing. There's like nothing to recover. I look up on Google how to recover documents. You can't really do it in pages. I'm like, what the heck, right? This is a problem. I'm preaching in two days. God, I trust you. I want to see your grace. What's going on? Well, long story short, I decided to uh, go to church, and I'd worked on it on my church computer in the afternoon. I decided to unplug all the internet so that it doesn't sink to the the cloud, and therefore it'll still be there. And lo and behold, it was. But you know, even as I was uh, going to church, you know, I'm singing. I'm like singing worship songs. Uh, Not because I want to, because I need to, right? I'm thinking, in Christ alone, I place my trust. I trust you, God. I trust you, right? Completely out of context, but I'm just singing it, just asking God for some sort of divine miracle. You know what's so interesting? I mean, I was really scared. (laughs) I was really scared. Thinking, okay, I, I may have to stay up all night Friday night, work on it all day Saturday again, and maybe all night sa- uh, Sunday, and so that I could have something good for you, to, you know, so that you, you came here to hear God's word, right? I want to give you God's word. I want to bless you. I want to feed you. I want to encourage you. And it's in that God was just asking me, do you trust me? Like, really, do you trust me? And you know what I was thinking? Well, God, you're sovereign, but you don't, like, control you know, documents on pages, right? You don't, like, control, like, the iCloud, and you don't do that, do you? Right? It's like, like, God, this is not in your realm, right? You know, God's saying, you know, he's like, you know, he's questioning my theology, like, you should be a pastor, right? You, like, yes, I'm, I'm that sovereign. I'm that, there was no reason for that document to disappear. I did nothing wrong. Double-clicked it, it was gone. God was teaching me, really, the message that, the message that you're going to preach. Can you live it out? And so that, basically, it was about a four-hour debacle. I really tried my best, saying, okay, even if I don't recover it, God, there is a reason. After I got it and, and everything, I, and I, I thank God, I worshipped him, Something happened. I felt more intimate with him. It was through the trial I was more aware of his presence. You see that illustration? I didn't come up with that. That was all God. I really believe it's a lesson that God wants to teach us. It's a lesson that he teaches the church over and over. Well, the people of God over and over in the in the in the in the Old Testament and then in the church in the New Testament. The, the, the Israelites, they didn't get it. So he taught them over and over. He tested them over and over. Don't you see what's in your heart? Don't you know that you need me? And so in John 6, in John 6, it's a passage of Jesus feeding the multitudes, the 5,000, probably 20,000 with, with wives and children. And in that he says later on in, in, in uh, chapter 6, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. But just before that, John 6, 41, this is how it describes the people. And get this, John 6, 41. So the Jews grumbled about him. 
Same word, grumble, complained. 661, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, they said to them, do you take, do you take offense at this? Generation after generation after generation after generation, we don't learn our lesson. We continue to believe that our circumstances define God. And the question that he has for us is, will you allow some faith to enter? Will you allow some trust to enter? Can you believe that circumstances don't define him? but that he will define your circumstances. He will put you in places for a reason. Why? Because he wants to do relationship with you. He wants you to understand how much you need him. Every time you're in a trial, what he is saying is, you don't know me. You don't know me well enough. I want you to know me better. I am your God. You are my people. I want you to know me, to delight in me, to worship me. I'm the best thing you got. Do you get it? And so Jesus, this is how much he wants us to understand this lesson. And the Lord's Supper, which represents the cross. It's in this, he says, I give my flesh. Do this in remembrance of me. It's the Passover meal. It's the manna. It's the bread. It's him. He's saying, you need me. Every, every month we take communion. It's a reminder. What we're saying is, God, I need you. Give me grace. I need you. I want to know you more. But all the more, not only during the Lord's Supper, but when the disciples ask him, Jesus, how do you pray? Teach us how to pray. He teaches us the same lesson. Give us this day our daily bread. Every day, church, we need it. Every day, church, he's teaching you. Every day, he wants you to understand you need him. When you're hungry, you need him. If you're going through a trial, what he's telling you is that I'm going to put you there because at this time, you need to know that I'm there. Maybe you've been stagnant in your Christian walk for some time, so he's put you in a trial. Why? So that you would realize you need him. That's what God is doing. This is a lesson that's true for all of us. It'll be a lesson that I believe I'll continue to learn to the day that I die. And so whether we've been a Christian for one day or 20 years or 50 years, that if we're, if we're in some sort of financial struggle, some sort of turmoil with friends, whatever it is, that we would learn to say, why? God, why are you putting me in this? And in that you would learn, God, I need you. I need your grace. I need you to work through this. And every time he puts you in a trial, what he's telling you, he says, yeah, I want you to know me more. I want to do relationship with you. Every time we're in a trial, it's an opportunity to trust him, to see his grace, and to know him in your failures and in your success to do relationship with him every single day. Let's pray.